And so now we move on to uh, Rakini. Thank you, Rakini. Um, hello, can everybody hear me? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Jill. That was just, you know, really um, loneliness is, is a huge issue with what's happened to all of us. Um, I'm going to just charge through my paper in case I don't get through it. So I'm just going to um, start now. So my contribution to the panel includes different perspectives of the elements associated with liveness and performance, such as intimacy and embodiment and the limitations of online performing bodies across the arts that due to its very nature creates a sense of absence or erasure. I will also be drawing on my recent multidisciplinary exhibition, which is titled Inhabiting Erasures, Embodying Traces of the Feminine, which was in March of this year, that focused on the erasure of women from global misogynist atrocities. The work was developed during lockdown and self isolation. My only contact with the world outside was via social media and Zoom. Um, the exhibition aimed to expand my concept of embodiment and invisibility or erasure. I expressed these through my journal art, large scale canvas paintings and installations using canopies, costumes and objects that created a sense of the absent body. For the opening and closing performances with live music, I inhabited one of the empty canopies. Um, I also draw on another conference that happened right in the middle of our lockdown last year in July 2020, when I participated in another online conference titled Dance Lab, which is produced by Dance Nucleus, co-curated by Daniel Koch and Sean Chua from Singapore. The lab, which was facilitated by C Critical Path in Sydney, hosted 60 participants from six regional clusters across Australia, Hong Kong, India, Singapore, Philippines, and Taiwan and interrogated the invisibility slash impact of live bodies versus an online performance arena. Discussions centered on identifying the ways of nursing into being a new vital reality that addresses absences, exclusions, and erasures that have appeared in the collective body. The hostile environment um, of the ongoing pandemic has illuminated the precarious nature of the artist's plight, a condition already plagued by its own pre-pandemic chronic illnesses. The complex issues of sustaining a performing arts practice aside from financial support is dependent on physical and mental well-being in order to maintain a stressful level of what many feel that's happened in the past year, which is a relentless productive output that has weighed heavily on us. Um, the interesting structure of Dance Lab was, uh, sorry, uh, yes, from my own experience and contact with colleagues in India, Europe, and the US, I discovered that the pandemic induced pressure to remain relevant, competitive, and strong has proved to be an added challenge for many, requiring an altogether new form of virtual stamina. The interesting structure of the Dance Lab conference was its method of analysis of the pandemic body by dividing the topic into three main areas for discussion. Um, Rakini, uh, please slow down. Please okay. slow down. For the translation? Sorry. Yes, the, for the translation, you need to slow down a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, the interesting structure of Dance Lab was its method of analysis of the pandemic body by dividing the topic into three main areas of discussion, mainly diagnosis that addressed the pandemic body and the metaphors for illness. The second was clinics that addressed the prognosis 
and finally treatment and rehabilitation. These discussions were separated into small groups chosen by the facilitators. And then at the end of the day, we, we got together and discussed uh, what we had come across. The collective diagnosis that emerged from these exchanges was that our already flawed and chronically ill system has been brought into sharp focus with the onset of the global pandemic. Key topics of debate included, how can we thrive within this new diseased environment? How does the COVID body move and survive? How do we dismantle the disparities of resources and hierarchical pressures that affect us disproportionately? How do we chart a course of action whilst gripped with fear, isolation, and a general sense of malady. After months of many of us being in lockdown and quarantined repeatedly, our collective enforced retreat gave us a sense of urgency and desperate need to share and exchange our responses. Time and time again, I was struck by the disparity of experiences of artists from different countries in contrast to my own privilege and in comparison to my colleagues in India and other parts of Asia. The pandemic was another disaster to add to political trauma in different parts of the world. For example, Hong Kong artists were suffering political unrest and months of curfews. India was still reeling from the terrible, shameful treatment of its migrant workers. These additional ruptures of peace and the consequences to the economy dictated or shaped um, as the general sense of what was happening. Um, I realized that practicing my art was a privilege. Isolating alone was a privilege. The realization of these disparities led to my right another paper titled Power, Privilege and Performative Wokeness. Um, I'm just keeping in case I am going to run out of time. Um, Sorry, I'm having technical problems with these two laptops happening here. Um, so I read a bit of Philip Oslander's 2008 work called Live and Technologically Mediated Performance, which suggests that the concept of liveness is a moving target whose definition changes over time in relation to technological development. I quote an excerpt from his work, Liveness, Performance in a Mediated Culture. It may be that we are now at a point at which liveness can no longer be defined purely in terms of either the presence of living human beings before each other or physical and temporal relationships between them. The emerging definition of liveness may be built primarily around the audience's effective experience. To the extent that websites and other virtual entities respond to us in real time, they feel live to us, and this may be the kind of liveness we now value." Close quote. The language of the body is not singular. It is a language of the past, the present, always immediate. The response or interaction of the audience and the sense of intimacy that is generated through these encounters measures the experiences of live performance. Anne Marsh in her book Performance Ritual Document offers a positive aspect of online performance. What happens when participatory performance practice embraces the internet and is used to address personal and political issues? Here we have a mediated performance that is inclusive and harnesses the potential of the internet to connect people across the globe. In some instances, these connections between people have highlighted the intimacy of reception that's built into the internet. Thus, on one hand, 
The internet can stress surveillance and distraction, and on the other, as it has been to individual personal computers in our homes, it can create the platform for intimate exchanges. As an artist researcher who has spent an entire career interrogating various possibilities and methods of embodiment, the pandemic has created both challenges and opportunities to forge new connections and learn new skills of communication. Exploring a pathway through this new reality presents opportunities not only to redefine the relationship between the individual's mind and body, but also to reach diverse cultures and communities on a global scale. Uh, Rakini, please uh, slow yeah. down. Please slow okay. down. While performance on screen is nothing new, it has always been an artistic choice, an additional mode of communication, experimentation and freedom to expand, especially conceptual works onto screens and enabling accessibility. This is a different experience to how liveness and performance is now defined due to travel restrictions, etc. The collective, collective feeling is a sense of grief, a mourning for what has been lost, the fear of uncertainty, and most specifically affecting the livelihoods of artists. But by reflecting on the crucial aspects of liveness that we all took for granted, could we learn new ways of inhabiting these recurring absences and erasures? For example, I recently attended two evenings of a three-day event presented by Performance Space at Carriageworks called Live Dreams, which took place in a physical theater um, in Carriageworks and was streamed live. Um, what I found was that a lot of the works, um, I found that many of the streaming in real time performances had worked more seamlessly than others that combined or presented pre recorded video. In some cases, I found the stream live performance even more engaging than the physically present present live performances, something I would never have imagined in the past. I questioned my own shift in perception of viewing work and find that while the live body in performance will never be obsolete, the option to view it at home anywhere in the world is one that is becoming the norm. I did wonder, however, if we were now becoming so attuned to watching screen-based or mediated performance due to our saturation of extra screen time during lockdown, that it almost seems a comfortable, less engaged, lazy, less present attitude to watch this mix of live and online format of performances, even when we are present physically in a theater. This show was one of many examples of how audiences are being encouraged to experience art, not only in different media, but to have a choice of witnessing without being physically present. Like many of my friends and colleagues being isolated or canceled, I longed for live performance, human contact and the sheer enjoyment of sharing with other bodies in a venue. I, tr I I'm going to skip a few things because I'm afraid of running out of time. Um, conferences like this one generating research, including case study, will continue to provide divergence and consolidation of the liveness debate that reveals more areas that needs, needs to be addressed. For example, where does this leave performance that is driven by ritual? Ritual is often a sensory experience enhanced by the presence of other bodies, sound, aromas, and in my opinion, incapable of evoking the same experience viewed on a laptop or phone. The limitations of the online experience cannot compare to the liveness of performance due to the physical absence of an audience that is essentially a crucial element of the performance. 
For example, my cultural and traditional study and practice of Indian classical dance is embedded in the theory of rasa, which is the taste and essence of the performance that cannot be easily defined in Western terms, that can be applied theoretically to contemporary and universal terms. In speaking of rasa, I refer to the state of artistic emotion or savoring the essence or the juice of the performance. Rasa in this context of liveness is regarded as an essential component of any work of visual, literary or performing art. It has been described as a contemplative abstraction in which the innermost emotions of both the rasa generated from performance and the rasika, the witness and participant of the performance is equally suffused with the encompassing aura of embodied forms. The 10th century Kashmiri um, Shaivite philosopher Abhinava Gupta's famous philosophical commentary on the Natya Shastra, the Sanskrit treatise on the performing arts, is still relevant today. The long standing aesthetic tradition from ancient India can be applied to all cultures and traditions of the performing arts. According to the Rasa theory of the Natya Shastra, the entertainment is not the primary goal of the performing arts, but yes, instead to transport the audience or the Rasikas into a parallel realm infused with awe and bliss where he experiences the essence of his own consciousness. In concluding, from my own personal perspective, I realize now more than ever that performance and art have become anchors in my life. And during the long solitude and isolation of 2020, that the quiet of non-life performance does not reflect a regression or stagnation in art or one's practice. I look forward to embracing both realities and our evolution as artists, presenting bodies online or in the flesh is still performance and exchange and a hybridity that has always existed in some form in the history of performing arts. The liveness versus online discussion gives us the potential to develop mediating live performance as a subject that will generate endless expression, definition and research. Most crucial to this transformation is our process of creating a renewed awareness of the liveness of skin and breath and the vitality of the live presence that is at the core of our practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nathini.